Wow. I'm excited about being normal. <laughs> I just, I am. I am. I'm excited about being able to love people every day, everywhere I go. It should be normal to love people unless you're being hurt by people. <clears throat> it should be really normal to just be who God created you to be. God created you in his image. And God is love, so if he created you in his image, then he created you in the image of love. In the beginning, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, the word was God, right? So when we look into the word, we look into the very face of God. And no man can look into the face of God and live. When you're looking into the word, and you read the words that Jesus said, you're actually talking to Jesus face to face. When you're looking into the word of God and it's all inspired by God, people say, well, you know, it's a book and men have fault, and men have this. They do, but God doesn't. Right. And all scripture is God breathed and is used, is used for reproof, for edification, for encouragement, for building people up. And it's, 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 it's our food that we live by instead of just the natural food. It's the food that we live by. Because if we don't get in there, then we have no idea why we're here. So God created us in his image. And it says in Genesis, in, in the image of God, he made man. God created us in his image. God said, let us like, make man. God didn't say, let me make man. He said, let us make man. This is crazy. Let us make man in our image. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Always together, Trinity, before, here, and forever. A circle. People say, well, how was God created? He wasn't. He was. He just was. He is the great I am, right? So God said, let us create man in our image. And in the likeness of God, he made man. So in God's likeness, he made us. Guys, stay with me for a second. I just want to teach for a couple minutes. And then I want to roll into a couple things. And I'm sure God will give me when it's time. Because I don't know what they are yet. <laughs> I know that sounds funny, but it's true. All right, so, so in the beginning he made us and he gave man one commandment. He created Adam and then out of Adam he pulled Eve out of his rib, from a rib and he made woman. And he told them one commandment. He said, everything is yours, all is yours. And he created this garden. And in this garden there was no havoc, there was no destruction. It was to be under man's dominion. And in Genesis he said, have dominion, be fruitful and multiply, subdue the earth. So in the beginning, God made man, he created this safe place, this, this little place on this big, huge earth called Eden. And it was amazing. And I was just reading with my kids about it last night. So it's just a little, you know, children's story where, you know, in, in these six days, God worked, created on the seventh day, he rested. But when he looked at man, he didn't just say it was pretty cool. He said it was very good. And he was so pleased with what he created. So God created this, this one rule and said, don't eat this tree because the day that you eat it, you'll surely die. So when the enemy, Satan, who didn't have permission to force his way, but to just get you to question what God said. So he got Eve to question what God said because she saw the fruit, it looked good. Satan said, have a piece of this. Eve said, no way, God told us no way. He said, not, not to touch that. Well, what do you mean? He got them to question God's word. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, God's word. So he spoke to them and said, don't do it. One rule, I'm talking not just 613 laws and 10 commandments, I'm talking one. This is simple. Here's one rule. Don't eat this. That's it. It might look good, but it's not good. I'm telling you, it's not good. And so Satan said, did God? Come on. Did God really say you'll die? God just knows that when you do it, you'll be like him. God created. He said, let us make man in our image. And in the likeness of God, he made man. So Man was made in the likeness of God and in the image of God he was made. 
Satan said, God just knows that when you do it, you'll be like him. You're already like him, guys. You don't have to do anything to do it. You don't have to do anything to become who he made you. Yeah, but Satan says, God just knows. Come on. God just knows. Don't you want to be like God? Well, whoa. And then Eve offered to Adam. Adam, sometimes <laughs> I've heard ministers blame women. It's not your fault, ladies. I just don't have any time for that. It's not. Have you ever met my wife? I really don't have any time for that. No, but both were there. See, what Adam did is this. This is like crucial. So instead of Adam obeying the voice of his father, he obeyed the voice of another. God told Adam, don't do it. God told Eve, don't do it. Eve ate. Adam knew what God said, but Eve said, it's okay. So Adam ate. So Adam obeyed the voice of another instead of the voice of his father. So sometimes what happens is in life, we obey the voice of a person instead of the voice of our father. Or sometimes people can give us their opinions, but it's really not from the father. So we obey an opinion instead of the father. And sometimes we might have a spouse that might be in disagreement with where your life is, but you've heard the father, but your spouse says, no, you need to listen to me. This is a big deal. Because if you can't hear the voice of your father, you'll always obey the voice of another. Okay, if you can't hear the voice of your father, if you can't obey his voice, you'll always obey a stranger's. All right. If you can't directly have communion with the Holy Spirit and actually hear the voice of God, you'll always obey the voice of somebody else. Because that voice will speak louder. And if you don't know the voice of the father, the voice of a stranger sounds like his. We can't afford to be people that are sons and daughters of God that have never heard our Father's voice. And not just have heard, we need to hear. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. It's all going to go back to the Word. So we've looked at the book as something that are laws or rules in order to follow. But it's not laws and rules. It's actually a love letter written to us by our Father through agency of Holy Spirit. And all scripture is inspired by God and is used to edify and encourage, to reprove for correction for everything. It's all God breathed by God. It's so important that we understand it's for training, 2 Timothy 3.16, it's for training in righteousness. So what happens is when the Bible was written and it's word for word, line upon line, precept upon precept the whole way through, but it's all for training in righteousness. The Old Testament is what I had to do to be right with God. The New Testament is who I am because Jesus made me right with God. The Testament, the, the New Testament is actually the last will and testament of somebody that died and gave you an inheritance. A testament is written by a testator, but that will is not enforced until the testator is dead. So when the testator died, he left you something. But because Satan blinds the eyes of those lest they should see, we don't pick this up to find out what we really have and who we really are. Therefore, we live less than what we are because we don't know him and we haven't heard his voice. It's, it's really true. It's amazing. When I got saved, I was, so, I was so happy about this. And all I knew was just like one or two scriptures. And I was so excited. I'm like, no way. Like, God forgave me. That's an important one right there. Like, this is so important. Like, God so loved the world that he gave his son that whoever would believe in him wouldn't perish but have eternal life. Perish doesn't just mean go to hell. Perish means think like hell too. God so loved the world that he gave his son. This isn't just a one-time yes to Jesus prayer and then live like hell the rest of your life. It's not just a one-time Jesus prayer and then come to church and hope to get fed every Sunday. Sorry. It's not about that. Boy, you'll starve. You'll come for an amazing, because worship's amazing here, buddy. It's amazing. 
You'll come for an amazing worship service, and you'll have some goosebumps and tears, and God, thank you, you're amazing, yes, and hear a good word, wow, oh, yes, oh, next Sunday, six days away, seven days away. You can't afford that. Every day, every day, you're meant to be fed by the last will and testament. You're meant to be fed by the very one that created you. You're meant to have relationship with the very one that created you so that when the stranger whispers, you can't, like, you, you can't have any attention to that voice. The stranger always talks. He's always saying something. He's always saying something. Sometimes he just says what people said. Sometimes he likes to say stuff and makes you think, make you think that God's the one that said it. Like, here's, the, here's one of the most famous ones, and this is what I'm encountering in the hospital every day. The voice of condemnation, guilt, and shame. It's horrible. It's, it's terrible. It's the devil. Moms that are in there with their babies that are completely condemned because they're the ones that put them in there like that because their baby is now going through withdrawal. These women, these women weren't on full-blown heroin. Most of these women were on methadone. Most of these women were on something to come off. But that drug wasn't designed to come off. That drug was designed to keep you hooked for life. I'm not mad. I'm just telling it like it is. When they come to get on methadone, it's a good change because it's something that's not illegal and something you don't have to get on the street and you don't have to shoot a needle in your arm. But when you get on methadone, it's designed to be just like heroin. It's not designed to have you wean off. It's designed to have you stay. Boy, the pharmaceutical community wouldn't like this. It's not okay. It's not okay to stay hooked for something for life, to say it's better than that when it's still a hook. So there are people that are trying to get free but aren't told they can be free and are told you're okay now because you're on this and it's not okay. Now I'll have more people after me. Whatever. You've met one that hates addiction all the way through. I hate it because it's the culture of the devil. I was over in Europe and People drink because it's culture over there. And I was with leaders. I mean, I've, I spent time with leaders and we're sitting at dinner. And, and uh, they said, hey, would you like a glass of wine? I said, no, I'm okay. I don't. Well, no, no, there's a culture here. I said, why would I violate my conscience for your culture? Come on. Well, you don't have to be legal. That's what, that's the comments. You don't, like, uh, you don't understand. This is, our, this is our country. This is how we grow up. I said, okay, but the Bible, no matter where you grow up, is the same. The word is the same, whether you grow up in Africa, Europe. It doesn't matter where you are. The Bi my Bible is the same. Even if it's interpreted into your language, it's the same Bible yeah. as it is in mine. And the Bible says, come out and be separate. Yeah. It doesn't say blend in and be like. It says, come out and be separate. Yes, thank you, God. Hallelujah. People say, well, I don't have a problem with alcohol. When you're on the highway and the, and the speed limit says 70 and you go 84 because everybody else is, the speed limit says 70. Yeah, but everybody's going, okay, come out and be separate. Come on. Like, people are like, oh, come on. <laughs> Alcohol to speed limit. Are you kidding me? See, here's, here's the point. When you, when, you start, when you start pushing the line, when you start taking the line that is here because the word is here, you start pushing it a little further than, than the word's here. And then, then it's a little further. And then the word pretty much isn't there anymore. Then you've, what you've done is you've, You've taken your conscience and you've, you've crossed lines and barriers and different things that the Holy Spirit wants to set up called conviction. And instead of obeying convictions, 
you start to disobey convictions. And then that still small voice gets quieter and quieter and quieter. Then all of a sudden the stranger's voice gets louder and louder and louder. And then you start to justify yourself for where you stay and you call it grace. I, I, I love Jesus with all my heart. I'm not some legalist that wants to impose rules on people. I'm not. I am in love with God with every part of my being. Every part of me. But if the word's not in your life and the truth isn't in your life, then anything goes. And then all of a sudden, well, you know, I believe, personally, personally, I believe if, if God was this, if God was that, then, then he would be like this. Well, personally, I mean, if God is love, then obviously, I get this all the time, then obviously God's okay with this and this and this. No, God, he's, he's not okay with what you think he's okay with. God's okay with you submitting and saying, God is my everything. And since I make my, God my everything, my word, the word that he has created for me, I'm going to dive in there and actually learn and understand who God's created me to be so that I know what is right and what is wrong. Yes, all right? Kind of. Some of you are looking at me angry. Whatever. There's a way that seems right to a man. And it's destruction in the end. I'm telling you that God made this thing easy for Adam and Eve. He said, this one thing, don't do it. Because in the day you do, you'll die. And Eve ate, Adam obeyed, her ate too. Both of them disobeyed God, period. And then they hid from the one that created them. So what happens is when you know that something's wrong, you actually hide from the one that created you. Adam, where are you, Adam? We were afraid. We were naked. Who told you you were naked? Um, here's what Adam said. It's crazy. Did you eat the tree? It's the woman you made. She, she's the one that deceived me. If you wouldn't have made her, if you wouldn't have made her, I would have never done this. There. Serious? Did, you did this? Well, you know, you're the one that made the serpent, and if you wouldn't have made the serpent, I wouldn't listen to the serpent, Adam wouldn't have listened to me, and it's your fault. It's crazy. It's always your fault. It's God's fault. It always is. I meet so many people that are mad at God. It's God's fault. God did it. God did this. God did that. God did that. God didn't do anything but love us and give his son and provide everything for us according to life and godliness. But we blame him for things that he's never done because we really don't know him. And we've listened to the voice of a person instead of the voice of our father. And we've listened to the opinion of a man or a woman that's been attacked one time after another. And they have their view of who God is when God is love. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. What did the enemy do in the garden? He got them to question God. He stole, killed, and destroyed. He destroyed their covenant. He stole their birthright. Be fruitful and multiply. Subdue the earth. Have dominion. Here, Adam and Eve. Keys. Whoa. The keys of authority God gave them. Be fruitful and multiply. Raise up kids just like you, Adam, just like you, Eve, that worship me out of free will. It's going to be amazing. And the rule of my government will have no end. Subdue the earth. You have dominion in this garden. But as you raise up kids that worship me out of free will and worship me, we'll have a relationship together. We'll walk and talk in the cool of the garden. And the garden will expand, expand and the rule of my government will have no end. Plan of God. Plan of God. Boom. Did God really say? Come on. Did he? He didn't really. He just knows that when you do this, you'll be like him. Well, it looks good. It tastes good. I can see. Here, I can see. If you eat this, you can see too. Boom. And they became slave to that one which they obeyed. Boom. Done. God, I can't let you stay here. 
you have to go. And he clothed them with animal skins. He took off their fig leaves, clothed them with animal skins, which is a form of a blood covenant. It's amazing. But he saw the devil in Genesis 3. And he looked at him and he said, cursed are you to crawl on your belly all the days of your life, all the days of the year, all the days you will be cursed to crawl on your belly. And I tell you this, the seed of this woman, the seed of this woman will crush the head of your seed. You'll bruise his heel, but he'll crush your head. Covenant. God, there's going to be one to come. And when he comes, you're done. Now, Eve, Adam, you got to go. Satan, on his belly. That means that you're not one that's supposed to crawl on your belly. That means that you're not worthless. You're not a worm. Jesus to come. Born. Born of a virgin. The seed. God. God's seed. Abraham. Abraham's covenant. Isaac. All the way through. Isaac. The seed. Your seed will be blessed. All these stars. Your seed. The seed was Jesus. So that means that we're part of this thing. But Jesus comes. God's prophecy. He prophesied. The one that comes. Your seed. Your seed's going to be crushed by my seed. Jesus on the earth. Boom. What did Jesus do? He came to restore that which was lost. What was lost? You. What more was lost? Your identity. Your sonship. Your authority. The reality of you being able to walk with God was lost. Jesus restored that which was lost. So when Jesus paid the price that he did, Satan took him. Satan took him. Man, when Jesus was tempted, when he went down into the river Jordan, came back out, he went into the wilderness. Listen to this temptation. This is crazy. He goes out into the wilderness. Before he went in there, he was baptized in the river Jordan. And what did God say? I'm in teaching mode. Sorry. We're just going to hit this. What did God say to Jesus when he went down in the water and came back out? This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Right? Jesus just heard his father say, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. The Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus. Why did the Holy Spirit descend upon Jesus? When Jesus came down to that river and he asked John the Baptist, he said, John, I need you to baptize me. John was baptizing people under repentance. Jesus didn't need to repent. So when John was down there, he sees Jesus coming. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Are you with me? Are you sure? I'm just on a gospel track here. Just follow me through. So John the Baptist sees Jesus coming. Jesus comes to John and said, I need you to baptize me. And John says, you're coming to me, but I need your baptism. Jesus couldn't baptize John with the baptism that he was going to give because he had to be crucified and resurrected for the Holy Spirit to come down. But he says to John, it is necessary so that righteousness might be fulfilled. The whole Old Testament, because of what Adam did, because because of man falling, from grace, falling from the reality of who God was in relationship with them. Then comes Moses. Moses gets the law, all the law, everything. Ten commandments, 613 laws, live by standards, cursed if you don't walk the way that I give you every day. If you don't go to the left and to the right, then you're blessed. It was impossible for man to do that. So Jesus is coming to fulfill something, to fulfill the law. Righteousness would be given to somebody if they walked not going to the left and not going to the right. If they obeyed every commandment and every law every day without missing one. You can't afford to try to live that way. Because living that way causes Guilt, shame, and condemnation because there's no way for you to be free and you constantly will be bound with guilt, shame, and condemnation. It's a no, there's no way to get through that thing. No way. God created it because man chose a man instead of God. They saw the lightnings and the thunders on Mount Sinai when Moses said, come on, let's go. This is amazing. The fear of the Lord is good. And the children said, no way, dude. You talk to him. Uh, we don't want, we'll listen to you. 
So they chose Moses instead of the father. And so man brought the law on. And it became this crazy, unquenchable fire. Because even though you want to do good, you can't. And even though you will to do it, you don't. Because it's sin in you that's doing this. There's no way to be free. It's guilt, it's shame, and condemnation. Moses was given a ministry engraved on stones, which was the ministry of condemnation. Jesus was given the ministry of righteousness, that we could have that. So Moses was given the ministry of condemnation engraved on stones, but we have been given the ministry of righteousness, not engraved on stones, engraved on the heart, written on tablets of flesh, that is of the heart. This ministry of stones, this ministry of trying to obey the law and trying to do everything perfect in your own strength, you can never do it, you will fall short. All have sinned and all have fallen short. There's no way for you to be okay here or here by trying to obey without the Spirit of God and the truth of God's Word. No way. There's no possible way. You will live in condemnation, you will live in guilt, and you will live in shame all the days of your life. There is no hope in there. You are hopeless. That's why Jesus Christ paid a price to put Christ in you, the hope of glory. The Holy Spirit in you. Christ wasn't Jesus' last name. It was the anointing. So Jesus, Jesus, it was prophesied by God in Genesis 3 that He's coming. The seed is coming. The seed of this woman. On through the line. Adam and Eve. Boom. Jesus. Bang. On the earth. Woo. Through the womb. Yeah. The Virgin Mary. You're going to bear. You're going to bear the Christ. You're going to bear him. It's going to be amazing. What? I, but I'm a virgin. Like this, how? This? Because God. Let it be unto me. Listen to this according to your word. This is so, so important that we would take God's word and put it where he put it. Because in Psalms 138, verse 2, he put, he magnified his word above his own name. God's name, God's word. That's crazy. So if we, what we don't do is we don't take heed according to his word, so it's really hard for us to cleanse our ways. We don't, we don't let the word be our priority, and we focus on all these other things to try to occupy our time instead of the very thing that'll save you and make you a redeemer of time. That's not a spanking. That's the truth. The word is not meant for you to try to memorize and for you to try to get it all in in one day. The word is something that you put in there, and it's like a guy that, that, that goes to bed at night, and right before he bed at night, he threw a bunch of seed out his back window. And he got up in the morning, he looked out back and went, whoa, how did all these get there? <laughs> really? That's the word. The word is something that you can't even tell when it's going. You, most times, it, <clears throat> it just bypasses this thing. It bypasses. It doesn't even, it doesn't even settle here. It has to go here. And then it comes back up here. So sometimes we're trying to get it, like read a whole chapter, well, well, I didn't really get anything out of that, jeez. But what you don't understand is it's being deposited in here. So over time, it produces fruit. But if you don't get it in here, you can never find out what God thinks about you. And you'll always live by what the devil says about you. You'll live by regret, shame, guilt, condemnation. You guys okay? Yeah. All right. Let's go a little deeper. This is awesome. Yay. So Jesus grows up as a boy to a young man. The only time in Scripture that it even talks about him is when his parents lost him in Jerusalem. He's just a little kid. They're leaving. They left Jerusalem. They're on their way back. There's a pack of people going, a lot of people going. And Jesus is gone. They lost God. That's a bummer. <laughs> As a parent, you're going to be really concerned about what just happened. Jesus is in this, he's back there in the temple. He's actually talking to the 
to the Pharisees. Talking about God, talking about his father. The Pharisees are bewildered. They're like freaked out at this young man's wisdom. And his parents are like, don't you, don't you care? <sighs> Look what you've done to us. Well, Mom, didn't you know I'd be about my father's business? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. Let's go. <laughs> Crazy. He goes through his life, lives completely perfect, never, ever sins. And he didn't do it as God. He did it as a man in right relationship with God. See, God made a covenant with Moses. This is so, so, so important. I mean, all of it is. It's the Bible. But God made a covenant with Moses, and he said to Moses, here's my law. There's 613 laws and 10 commandments. In order for you to be right with me, since you want it this way, you have to obey every law and every commandment, and you can't miss one. Because if you miss one, you've missed them all. Which means no matter how good you are, no matter how bad you are, you're still just as bad as a person that's really bad. Yeah. So whether you miss one law or whether you miss 613 and 10, this is crucial. This was like something in my life that hit me in the beginning, like in this way, because everybody said, Todd, the reason why you love so much is because you've been forgiven so much. And I looked at people and said, well, this is true. Because I didn't have a, a the spirit of wisdom and revelation didn't dawn on this thing. For me because you have Luke 7 and I always talk about it because we have to get this in Luke 7 the woman busted into the house and anointed Jesus' feet with the alabaster jar her tears and her hair and the Pharisees were freaking out saying if this man knew who what kind of a woman this was if he really were a prophet he'd never let her touch him and Jesus says Simon suppose you have two one out of 50 and one out of 500 the 50 was just a teeny bit. The 500 was a mega amount. But the master knew that neither could repay. So he forgave them both. Which one would be more loved? And since we're talking about money, it's easy. If you're forgiven a debt of $100, or if you're forgiven a debt of a million dollars, which one would make you more appreciative? Well, that's easy. So he uses money because it's real easy for people's brains to get that. Well, I suppose, of course, the one he forgave more. And that's true. And this woman who is a sinner. He said, this is going to go down forever. It's never going to be able, it's never going to be taken out of the word. This will never be taken out. And it will always be there in the word the whole way through. As an example, he said, the one whom he forgave more. And this woman who is a sinner, because she'd been forgiven much, she loves much. Problem. We have taken that to mean that the person that has sinned the most has the right to love more than the person that think they haven't sinned at all. So now you have people that are like me that have disobeyed 613 laws and 10 commandments willingly. That rebelled in such a horrible way that forgiveness came now I love much but you have somebody else that's lived a good life but only lied once maybe only bent the truth a couple of times but pretty much been honest your life is equally just as sinful as my life and until you see that self-righteousness will keep you from loving much There's nobody that's better than another. All, all, all have sinned and all have fallen short. All have. So whether you were a drug addict for 22 years or whether you were an amazing man your whole life, missed it once, your whole life was a wash. This will keep you from loving people because you will think that you're pretty good. Self-righteousness is, is probably one of the most wicked sins that are out there. Self-righteousness enables you to look above people instead of come down and look up at people. Self-righteousness makes you think that you're above people. Self-righteousness says, come out from among them and be separate. Don't associate with people so you don't get dirty. Righteousness says, I used to be really filthy. But God made me really clean. Not in my own 
Because self-righteousness is filthy rags to the Father. Righteousness is different. See, when Jesus did what he did, he paid the price for all to be right in the eyes of our Father. For all of us to have a relationship with a loving Father. For all of us to have an amazing thing called grace on our life. To enable us to understand an amazing thing called truth that's in front of us. You guys all right? Oh, I love this. This is really good. So sometimes I, I teach and I'm sharing my heart and I've never seen it put together like this. I just love it. And God's like, he's going, and he's taking all these scriptures and he's just making them solid so that they can never come apart. I just, that's how he does it with me. I read the word, I, I, I just, and then all of a sudden something I read seven years ago will come in and come together. Oh, whoa, ah, that's why, yes. And I get excited and people are like, what's wrong with you? It's not what's wrong, it's what's been made right. It's what's been made right. When you realize that you are right with God, when you realize that you've been made right with the one that created you, guilt and shame and condemnation can never whisper its voice to you again. How many of you would like to never be guilty, ashamed, or condemned? Only five, six of you. This, this isn't strange doctrine. This is the Bible. It's the word that sets you free. But it's not just the word that sets you free. It's the word that keeps you free. The truth of it. The great news is that you don't have to be some scholar to get it. Because if you're a scholar, you might be able to just read the book and say, I already did it. No. Read it the whole way through in a year. That's, that's not good. <laughs> I always tell people that the iPad is awesome because I can look at one page and there's only like 20 scriptures on there. And I flip it when I'm ready. Sometimes that book becomes overwhelming when I see how thick it is. True. I tell my daughter, you know, she's... I, just a, a couple of years ago, Destiny, she's like, Dad, this is such, such a lot in this book. I go, yeah, I haven't even read the whole thing. She goes, what? Dad, you preach the gospel. What do you mean you haven't read the whole thing? I'm like, no, I'm still trying to, I'm still trying to swallow yeah. what I've put in my mouth. Honestly, people sometimes, ministers, oh, that's, well, I've read a whole lot more than that. Or, well, he, that's not okay. He didn't go to Bible school. That's, that's, something's wrong here. What if it's not what's wrong? What if it's what's been made right? And what if I just really see who God's created me to, to be? And what if it's not about how much you've read? What if it's about what you've become that you've read? What if it's not about how much you've memorized? What if it's about old things passing away and all things yeah. becoming new? Yeah. But what if we've started our life in Christianity and we have got born again 30 years ago? And what if we have went through Bible school and ministry school and all that stuff, but you're still condemned? Mom. That wouldn't be good and that wouldn't be the gospel because Jesus has paid a price for us to be free. You guys all right? Amen. And I'm not pointing the finger at ministers or Bible school or none of that stuff. I'm not. The blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus is what has made us free. Like the blood of Jesus has made us so free that whom the Son sets free is free indeed. But if you're not free... Second Corinthians... Three talks about Moses having been given the ministry engraved on stones but it was the ministry of condemnation so Moses in the most amazing ministry that he had been given was engraved on stones and it was the ministry of condemnation but we you, I, people that are born again, sons and daughters of God have been given a different ministry there's a complete different ministry. 
See, the ministry that Moses was given was the ministry of condemnation engraved on stones. But the ministry that we have been given is the ministry of righteousness. The ministry engraved on stones had glory. But the ministry of righteousness has much more glory. It says that the letter kills. The ministry engraved on stones, it kills. But the Spirit gives life. Amen. The ministry of reconciliation is the ministry that Jesus gave us. But the ministry of reconciliation can only come when you've understood the ministry of righteousness. We have been given the ministry of righteousness. Righteousness is that I have right standing with God. You guys with me? All right. I'm backtracking and going forward and staying in the same spot, but we'll end well. All right? I need to, I need to, and I've been praying, God, help me be a better witness. It's, <clears throat> help me be a better witness of what you've done. Help me not ever take this gospel this glorious gospel of holiness, of purity, of no compromise, of power, of freedom, of grace that empowers truth to happen. Help me never take that and lower the standard. Help me never try to clobber people over the head with it to tell them they need to be like me. Because I just want to be like you. God, help me explain what freedom is in the gospel in a simple way that a four-year-old can understand it. So that if a four-year-old can understand it, then an adult that's been saved for 65 years can understand it too. And that one, in one moment, God, boom, freedom can come. And the truth of who they're created to be all their life can hit. We need to understand this amazing blood covenant that we've been given. The blood covenant is so awesome, so awesome that God's son was sacrificed to make you become sons and daughters. That God told the devil that the seed of this woman, he's going to crush your head. You're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. There are two seeds that are actually trying to reproduce themselves in your soul, in your mind, your will, and your emotion. There is the seed of the enemy. Guilt, shame, condemnation, depression, bitterness, unforgiveness, anger, wrath, rage, malice. All that stuff is trying to recreate itself here. And make you think according to the way that seems right to a man. Jesus told Peter when Peter said, when, when he said, who do men say that I am? Well, some say this and some say that. Yeah, but who do you say I am? And Peter said, you're the Christ. Because God, just a glimmer. You're the Christ, the Son of God. Blessed are you, Simon. <laughs> Blessed are you, Simon. Amazing job. Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. You didn't come up with that one yourself. It's impossible for man to come up with that one themselves. You heard from the Father. Awesome. Yeah. Yay. Simon's like, that's right. Mm, I heard from the Father. You guys didn't. I did. Because Simon's thinking like an orphan. He's not thinking like a son. He can't think like a son until Jesus, the son, pays the price for us to become sons and daughters. And the spirit of sonship comes. But Peter didn't have it yet. He had the Holy Spirit with him. Jesus says, don't fear, guys, in John 16. Don't fear. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come. But Peter, in this place, is still an orphan. Thinking. Getting a glimpse of thinking that he's, he knows it all. James and John, man, this is awesome, Lord. You've given us great authority. We went to Samaria, and they said, no, they don't want you. Let us kill them. <laughs> They've got power. Let us call down fire. Elijah did. Old Testament prophet. Give us the authority. You've already given us some authority. We're casting out devils. We're healing the sick. It's amazing. Blind eyes are open and deaf ears are open. Come on. The Holy Spirit was with them, but he wasn't in them. He was with them, and they had great power. 
These disciples were not even born again and they were healing the sick. They were cleansing the lepers. They were raising, they were doing the stuff and they were not born again. They couldn't be until Jesus was crucified, resurrected. But Jesus said, you know what? You're really messed up. Come with me. Peter, come on. Judas, you're going to betray me into the hands of men. You're going to sell me out for a couple pieces of silver. You're going to kiss me on the cheek and that's going to be the signal. Come on, follow me. Peter says, you're, you're, you're the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said, flesh and blood didn't give that to you, but my Father did. And upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Awesome job, Peter. Amazing. Wow, high five. That's right. And by the way, I'm going to die, Peter. No! You're not going to die. Forget it. All this power, this shall never happen to you. Away from me, Satan. Your mind is full of the things of man. What? Wait a minute. I thought I just heard from God. Now you're calling me the devil. What? No, no, no. I'm not calling you the devil. I'm saying you're thinking like the devil. Your mind is full of the things of man and not the things of God. And then Jesus says, uh, uh, unless a man deny himself, pick up his cross and follow me, he cannot be my disciple. What good would it be? For a man to gain the whole world, yet lose his own soul. What profit? Right? It's crazy, but Jesus is pointing out something real simple. He's saying, Simon, you're thinking like a man, and to think like a man is to think demonically. One day, you're going to think like the Father, but right now, get behind me. You're a stumbling block for me. What you don't understand, Peter, is that what I'm about to do is going to make you not think that way anymore. So get behind me. Are you with me? So Jesus goes through life, comes to the River Jordan. When he gets there, the whole Old Testament, there's 613 laws and 10 commandments in order for you to be made right with God. You have to obey all the days of your life. Jesus came, was born of the Virgin Mary, did and went through the whole law as a man, not as God, because God made covenant between man God and man. So if man gets his end, God has his end because he is holy. So Jesus walks and never sins all the days of his life. Comes to that river Jordan at 30 years old. I think I said it before. It'd be good for us to hear it again. At 30 years old in Jewish culture, you inherit everything that your father has. So when Jesus comes down to that river and he says to John, I need you to baptize me so that righteousness might be fulfilled. (coughs) Jesus didn't have any need to repent. But when he came down to the river and asked John, John said, I need your baptism. Jesus said, no, you need to do this because righteousness needs to be fulfilled. The fulfillment of righteousness is the fulfillment of the law. But the only one that it was fulfilled for is the one that walked it out. So Jesus got baptized in the river Jordan. The heavens were opened. They'd been closed for 400 years. John the Baptist came to prepare the way for the Lord. Now the Lord is here. John knew it. God said, the one whom the Spirit comes down upon, that's the one. The Spirit came down like a dove, rested upon Jesus. The heavens were opened, and what did God say to Jesus? This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. Jesus is led by the Spirit of God. He's led by the Spirit of God into the wilderness. He goes out into the wilderness, and he's there for 40 days. Now watch. The wilderness that Jesus went into is the only legal wilderness that we're allowed to be in. People say, I'm in the wilderness. Pray for me, brother. Well, my question is, there are two wildernesses you can be in. You can be in one that the children of Israel were in, out there, in, out there wandering around for 40 years. They were complainers. They were gossipers. They were murmurers. And they loathed the worthless bread. That was them. The very thing that God gave them to sustain life. That bread that came down from heaven. That Moses gave. Jesus said, Moses, Moses gave you bread. But really, it was my father who gave you bread. That bread that came down was living bread. I am that living bread. 
That means that every day that God satisfied the Israelites in front of their tent, every day there was a pile of manna in front of everyone. Think about it. Million, millions. Every morning, bread. Boom, right there in front. That manna, Jesus says, that was the living bread. And I am that living bread. Which means that Jesus was the manna that came down from heaven. And instead of being satisfied, they loathed it. So instead of being satisfied with that thing, instead of being satisfied with Jesus, they said, we loathe this worthless bread. Jesus says, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Then he says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they went, cannibal. But what Jesus wasn't just talking about communion. He's saying, unless I'm your everything. Unless I'm your everything. Unless I become your everything, you cannot be. Unless I become your everything, unless Jesus becomes your everything, you cannot be. So he's out there in the wilderness. He went into the wilderness selfless. He didn't go into the wilderness selfish. The children of Israel went through the Red Sea and they went into the wilderness selfish and they died there. Jesus went into the wilderness selfless. And he came out of the wilderness with the Holy Ghost and power. When you go in selfish, you die there. When's it going to be my day? When's it going to be my break? God, when, when's it my turn? What's, why does this stuff always happen to me? I can't believe they talked about me. That's just so stupid. Well, let me tell you what I think about them. You don't need that. What you need is selfless. You guys all right? Yeah. We were like, not really. <laughs> it's a whole lot. Soon lunch. So Jesus is tempted. He goes out. The first temptation that the devil says. Jesus is hungry. He's fasted 40 days. The enemy comes to him. And he said, if you are the son of God, if you are, here's what he's saying. I saw one just like you in the garden. I got them to eat. I'll get you to eat. If you are, then change these stones into bread. Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone. What Eve and Adam should have said. Man doesn't need this fruit. Our father said. Why? Because God just told Jesus, even though it's in Deuteronomy, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, from, by, but by every word of God. God said to Jesus before he went out in that wilderness, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus' last thing that he even heard before he went out there was God speak. Why did God say that? Jesus fulfilled righteousness. Righteousness was fulfilled for Jesus. God opened the heavens and says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. This is why sonship is so important in your life. Because when Jesus was tempted for the second time, the enemy, he takes him up and he shows him all the kingdoms of the world. And he says, all of this, all of this and their glory, all of this, the devil says, all of this and their glory has been given unto me. How did he get that? Adam and Eve gave him the keys. Satan is dangling the keys in front of Jesus, saying, all of this and their glory has been given to me. And I can give them to whoever I wish. Bow down and worship me, and I'll give you this. Jesus said, come on, man. Jesus didn't take the keys that way. If Jesus took the keys that way, you wouldn't be able to have what you have today. That's right. yeah. Satan tries another time. Takes him up a high point of the temple. Throw yourself off for it is written. Come on. The angels will catch you. Satan twists scripture. He tries to twist it. You need to know who God is and know what God says about you. Jesus comes out of the wilderness. He goes out and for three and a half years, it is profuse and amazing. Jesus did not heal as God. He healed as a man in perfect relationship with God. He was fully God and fully man. 
But when he was fully man, he defeated the devil as a man made in God's image. He fulfilled the law as a man. You have to understand that because the covenant was made between God and man. So when he fulfilled that, it was only the heavens were only open for him and whoever he gave authority to go and and do the stuff that he told them to do. So the disciples, when Jesus picks up these disciples, these guys are following him, and it is amazing, and everywhere he went, miracles, signs, and wonders happened everywhere they went. He gave the disciples authority, and it happened with them. Boom, 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 And then he says, he says to them that he's gotta go to the cross. Peter says, no, she'll never happen to you. You can't just leave. You're the best thing that ever happened to me. Get behind me, Satan, you're thinking like a man and not like God. I need to do what I need to do in order for you to be who you're going to be. But if I don't do this, you can't be that. Are you guys with me still? This is so powerful. So Jesus pays this ultimate price, the ultimate price. Heaven went bankrupt to get you back. That's the ultimate price, the worth that you have, the value that you have. Jesus came down, born of the Virgin Mary, grows up as a man, fulfills the covenant, that God made the last will and testament, the Old Testament, the law, 613 laws, 10 commandments. He pays this price so that you don't have to walk them out in your flesh because you can't anyway. Because even though you want to, you can't. And even though you will to do it, you don't. Because it's sin in you that crushes that thing, that disables you from being able to walk that way. You cannot do holy. You cannot, because it's this very guy, Peter, this very man that was thinking like a mere man instead of thinking like God, that Jesus rebuked and said, get behind me, Satan. You're thinking like a man and not God. Are you with me? So Peter and the disciples are traveling with Jesus. He gives them exousia, authority. We talked about it last week, but he can't give them dunamis because dunamis comes from being upon and within. The Holy Spirit wasn't within them. The Holy Spirit was around them. They got glimpses, they got glimmers, but they were on the outside looking in and they were operating with power as orphans and wanted to blow up cities and deny Jesus. Peter denied Jesus as an orphan that didn't want to deny, but did. And even though he willed to not deny him, he did. See, what we've done in the church sometimes is we've celebrated the carnal nature and the divine nature and we've made ourselves bipolar. And we've told people, well, you're always going to miss it. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say you have to wake up and miss it. People say, well, you're always going to sin. I just, I just asked people, when you got up this morning and you went and brushed your teeth, hopefully, when you went and did that, when you got into the bathroom and used the bathroom, did you sin? When you brushed your teeth, did you sin? Did you miss it? Not yet. When you ate breakfast this morning, when you ate cereal or eggs or whatever, did you sin? I hope not. Well, when you drove here, did you? How far can you go? How how long can you make it? Because when you think like Peter thought, This shall never happen to you, Lord. I can never be free. I will always sin. I will always fall short. When you think like that, you will manifest that. But if you don't see who God created you to be, you can never manifest who God says you are. And if you can't see who you be, you can't manifest who you are. You will always try to do to be. You always do things to try to please God instead of living from a place where you're already pleasing to God. It's works. The Old Testament was by works. So in order for you to be right, you have to obey 613 laws and 10 commandments in order to be right with God. You had to do right in order to be right. The New Testament is Jesus Christ that completely paid every every price for you, every price that needed to be paid. He became your substitute and he didn't just die for you, he died as you. And if you see the reality of what he did on Calvary, of what he did on that cross, it says that the handwriting of requirements against you was wiped out and nailed to him on the tree. It was wiped out as if there's nothing against you. But if you don't see what God created you to be, you will constantly be living under guilt, shame, and condemnation, and you will never be able to be free to be who you really are. And who you really are is a son.
guys, this has been almost 12 years of no guilt, no shame, and no condemnation in my life. People have said, well, that's a special gift. You're right. It's called the free gift of righteousness that the Bible says that you and I are to reign as kings in this life through the free gift of righteousness and the abundance of grace. That is a gift that's been given by God that rarely do I see Christians that have unwrapped it, and when they unwrap it, they don't believe it. Is it true that Jesus paid the price for me to be forgiven of all sin? If he paid the price for me to be forgiven of all sin, why would I revisit things that he paid the price for me to be free from? We have psychologically tried to find peace in this thing, and it's not psychological, it's supernatural. The blood of Jesus cleanses our conscience from dead works in order to serve God. Your conscience is is this very thing that remembers everything. Everything. And the blood of Jesus. Gosh, help me, Jesus. Yeah, but it needs to sink. <laughs> it does. You need to be able to look in the mirror and say, Whoa, I see you in there. <laughs> and, and not just on Sunday. Not just after service. I'm talking Wednesday morning. You wake up, you go in the mirror. Oh my God. Moses given the ministry of condemnation. That's glory. We've been given the ministry not engraved on stones. The ministry of righteousness that has much more glory. Yeah. It goes through and it says we all. It says the Lord is the spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Yeah. That means that where he's not, there's bondage. Yeah. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. We all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. It says, we, we move from glory to glory. We are being transformed into the same image. Moving from glory to glory, not from bummer to bummer. We are to move from glory to glory. It says, I'm unashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for them that believe. Romans 1.16. For in it, in the gospel, what's in the gospel? The power of it. What's in the power of it? The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. For it is written, the just, just, just as if I never sinned, just as if I never ate the tree. Jesus paid the price on Calvary, and he died not just for me, he died as me, so that I never have to revisit the things that I wish I'd never done. That all regret, all guilt, all condemnation, all shame could be wiped out completely so that I could look and have not just a clean slate, not just a second chance. Because if it was a second chance, you might mess that one up too. You might need a third chance or a fourth chance. It's not chances. It's a brand new life. Jesus paid a price for old things to pass away and for all things to become new. The problem is, is we don't believe all things. We don't. We believe there's some things left. Am I saying, because I'm talking about like living a life of purity, am I saying that we're never going to miss it? No, I'm not. I'm saying that the Holy Spirit becomes the convictor of your life. The convictor. And, it, and, and if you miss it, You have an advocate who's faithful and just to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. That doesn't mean that I live and I'm Mr. Holy. That just means that the Bible says, be holy, not do holy. When you be who God created you to be, and you see the reality of who God created you to be, and you see that you've been made right with the Creator, and you see that you're right in God's eyes. 
When you're right in God's eyes, you can have boldness to approach the throne of grace in time of need. And when's the last time you didn't need Jesus? You always need Jesus. We need to live in the throne room. Not that I have to see a sea of glass or lightnings and thunders and rainbows and all that. It's not about that. It's about knowing and believing the truth that God says about you and stop living by the lies that the devil is telling you and stop living by the opinions of people that say you always have to be bound because you're wrong. People say, well, you can't just be free. You're never going to really be free. So many people have told me that. You can't just be free, man. What are you talking about? Then what did Jesus pay a price for? Did he pay a price for you to live in bondage? No, he paid a price for you to be free. Who did he free you from? You. The gospel frees you from you so that you can be free from people. So that people no longer are your potter. So that situations no longer mold you or shape you. But you actually are the influencer in every situation that you walk into. So that everything you do, whether in word or deed, you are to do it as unto the Lord and not for people. And you are to live as a living witness, bearing witness to a living king, a living savior, that Christ in you is the hope of glory. So when he pays the price on Calvary, he pays the price not for your sins, just to be forgiven and remembered. He pays the price for your sins to be forgiven and forgotten. The blood of Jesus cleanses your conscience from dead works. So everything that you wish you'd never done, the blood of Jesus actively, internally cleanses you and washes you completely clean from who you were so that you can finally step in to who he says you are. But if you don't see this, then old things don't pass away and all things don't become new. Some things become new, but old things will constantly creep up on your life and cause you to do bad things. Because the more you look back in a rearview mirror from sins that Jesus says you're forgiven of, the more condemned you are and you can't drive straight. Because he who puts his hands to the plow, looking back, isn't fit for the kingdom. We have to believe the beginning of the gospel. We have to believe the blood of Jesus has set us free. We have to believe that we've entered into the law of liberty. We have to believe that we've been forgiven. And our Father isn't going to wipe it in our face and say, yeah, but remember this. That's not God. I remember the... The first time we baptized these, when we were doing that first baptism service, because it happened just the other, the other week when I was just down in Orlando, when these girls that were from Karen's house, I think they were, they had cuts all over their arms. And I was talking about the same thing I'm talking about now, talking about forgiveness and radical redemption, that if sin brought a stain into your body from yesterday, if you've been forgiven of that sin, then God wants to remove the mark that's in your body of yesterday. And it, it sounds crazy because people, well, you know, God wants you to keep that. Remind you, stop it. Jesus bore in his body our sicknesses, and he bore in his body our sin. It's a two part covenant. Why would God want you to keep something in your body that he paid a price to be removed? And if you've been forgiven and you've repented, then that thing no longer belongs in your body and it's trespassing. So I was just at another service. I, that night we baptized four girls. And each one of them came out with all their scars gone. It's really real. The other, night I'm, the other night, I'm in Orlando and I'm sharing my heart on this very thing, this very forgiveness, this very repentance and the reality of redemption. And uh, I asked these kids to come forward and a bunch of kids came forward that, just to say yes to Jesus. And, and the one girl down there, she's, she's growling and she's manifesting not good things. And I came down off the stage and I'm holding her and just praying for her, and she's, and she's growling at me, and tears, and anger, and hatred, not because she hates me, but she hates the Christ in me, and I'm sitting there praying for her, I don't even know what she's wrapped up in, all I know is this thing's bondage, and it needs to go, so we're praying for her, and all of a sudden, she gets really hot, she takes off her jacket, and she has a t-shirt on, she looks down, she starts going like this, and smiling, and laughing, and I said, what's up, she goes, oh, my scars are gone, I go, what do you mean? She goes, I have scars everywhere. I got new skin. I said, come up here right now. You're, you're a preacher. I said to her, she goes, no, no, I'm not. I said, come up on stage. I need you to share your heart with these people. They're all kids. 
she shares her heart. This lady gets on stage. She goes, I, I just want to say that I'm not in sin anymore. And she starts boldly proclaiming the gospel. This like 13 year old, 14 year old girl. I mean like, uh, 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 uh. sounds like Lisa Bevere, man. She's going after it. I mean, after it. And she goes, if you got scars on your arm, just lift your arms up right now. They lift them up. Eight kids, all their scars disappeared. All of them. Why? Because God can. Because he can. If Jesus bore in his body your sin, and we've been forgiven of our sin, he also bore in his body our sicknesses. So our sicknesses and our diseases can be removed. And if you've got STDs, and you've got cuts and scars and stuff from yesterday, Jesus wants to remove that stuff. Why? Because that's redemption. Having believed unto righteousness, dashed by his stripes, you're healed. That's the gospel. Okay, so if you've got any kind of stain from yesterday in your body, just stand up. I know people are like, no, I don't want to. You should. Okay, come on. Yay, Jesus. Awesome. Ah, come on. I want some people around these folks right now. We're just going to pray for them that every bit disappears. It's not a shameful thing. It's saying, I am not that person anymore. That was who I used to be, but today, this is who I am. I am a child of God. I am not one that is in sin. I am not one that is in, in this life, that this is a past. This is a mark from yesterday. I want people around everybody that's standing right now. Come on, guys. I've already gone late. I've got four minutes till 11 o'clock. Help me out here. Long-winded. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus, God. I thank you that every scar and every stain from yesterday would be removed. That every mark from yesterday and a life of sin, a life that we should have never been in. In the name of Jesus, we command it to go. Every bit of hepatitis C, every STD, every scar, every bit in Jesus' name, get out right now. I thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus right now. Freedom. Every cell, every scar from yesterday, you get out, you be removed in Jesus' name right now. I command these scars and these stains to get out. That is not who you are. You're not that kind of girl anymore in the name of Jesus. Right now, every bit, every liver, I command you be healed in Jesus' name. Right now, livers be healed. Hep C, get out. You're no longer welcome in this place. In the name of Jesus, God. I thank you, Father, that every disease from yesterday, every scar from yesterday, every track mark in the name of Jesus, I command them to disappear right now. Every stain, every laceration, every cut in Jesus' name, get out right now right now in Jesus name right now Jesus 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 every scar from yesterday gone holy holy Jesus every stain from yesterday gone Be removed by the blood of our King. Every bit of guilt and shame and condemnation. Get out of us. Get out of us. Get out of here now. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, now loose your people in Jesus' name. Sickness and disease, loose your people in Jesus' name. God, loose your people in Jesus' name. Every stain, every mark, all depression, all guilt, all shame, all condemnation, I command you, release God's people. 
a conscience that is washed by blood. In the name of Jesus, I thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, God, I thank you, Father. Brand new, brand new, right now, in Jesus' name, brand new, every cell. In Jesus' name. Put your hand on somebody beside you right now. I need everybody to help me. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus. I thank you for every bit of sickness, every bit of disease, every ailment in the name of Jesus. Kidney stones, get out in Jesus' name. Pancreas, come alive in Jesus' name. Lungs, come alive in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, every disease, get out. ALS, get out in Jesus' name. Every symptom from every disease, every sickness, in Jesus' name, get out. Freedom! 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 Freedom, Jesus! Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus, God, for great grace, great freedom. In the mighty name of Jesus, God, every sickness, every disease, get out. Every joint be healed. Every bit of arthritis, get out. Jesus' name. Every sickness, every disease, every sickness, every disease, get out. In Jesus' name. Cancer, get out in Jesus' name. Every disease, loose in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Brand new. Freedom! Freedom! Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus, God. 